Welcome to the River Online Sermon. Thank you for joining me as we dig into God's Word together. Let me pray for our time. Heavenly Father, we just want to thank you for this um, opportunity to study your Word. I pray that you would help me to be attentive to your Holy Spirit as I preach and teach. May help us all to be open to what you want us to receive from these words. And may you receive all the honor and glory. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. So, do you like math and science? I have to admit, I love basic math, like um, adding and subtracting and things like that. And I'm okay with some of the sciences, but uh, I, my mind just doesn't really work that way. In particular, I cannot remember or understand all of the different mathematic and scientific principles. Uh, some of my kids are really great at all that. My son Jacob is studying engineering at John Brown University and reads calculus and physics textbooks for fun. Well, today, we're going to take a look at a different kind of principle, and hopefully we can grow in our understanding of what this principle means, and not only understand it from the big picture perspective, but even on a more personal level, what it means for our own daily lives. Please turn with me in your Bibles to the book of Acts, chapter 5. For those of you who have not been um, with us recently, we are currently making our way through uh, the life of Peter, first through the Gospels, and and then after Christ's crucifixion and resurrection, um, we continued to follow Peter uh, through the book of Acts as we begin to see the early church developing. Now, our passage for today comes still early in the history of the church. The gospel has begun to spread. The church had begun to form and was growing daily. Uh, the early Christians had already begun to face the threat of persecution. Um, and Acts 5 points out that God was doing amazing signs and wonders among the, the people and um, there were many being healed and crowds gathering and many people were responding to the gospel. And all of that rubbed the Jewish religious leaders the wrong way. And we'll see that as we pick things up in Acts 5, beginning with verse 17. But the high priest rose up and all who were with him, that is the party of the Sadducees, and filled with jealousy, they arrested the apostles and put them in the public prison. But during the night, an angel of the Lord opened the prison doors and brought them out and said, Go and stand in the temple and speak to the people all the words of this light. And when they heard this, they entered the temple at daybreak and began to teach. Now, a few weeks ago, we looked at a passage where Peter and John were arrested, and they were threatened to stop preaching about Jesus after the, the healing of the lame beggar. Now, that threat came from the same people that we see mentioned here. The Sanhedrin were the ruling council of the Jews, kind of like a supreme court who oversaw both religious and political matters in the region. It was made up of the high priest and 70 other men who were a combination of religious authorities, lawyers, and rich elite members of society, many of whom were Sadducees. Now, the Sadducees in particular were a Jewish sect or school similar to the philosophical schools of the time, like the Stoics or the Epicureans, who had their own, uh, they, they, they would have had their own religious ideas that were different, different from other groups like the Pharisees, for instance. Now, based upon what we see here in these first few verses, what do, you this, what do you think of the Sanhedrin? Now, it sure seems to me to be a bit of a corrupt system, right? And here in particular, they seem to be displaying an abuse of power. And verse 17 reveals that their motivation was jealousy. Why were they jealous? Well, they were jealous possibly for a number of reasons. Part of it was potentially simply based on popularity. Thousands of people were flocking to the apostles. That was probably not happening so much for these religious leaders. But I also think that they were jealous of the power. Remember, the apostles' ministry was accompanied by miraculous, amazing signs and wonders. Uh, things were happening all over the place. And that was probably not true with Sanhedrin. The Sanhedrin had legislative authority and power, but there was actual authority and power demonstrated with the apostles' ministry. The Sanhedrin were jealous of them and probably felt threatened as they saw their authority being undermined and maybe some of their political clout vanishing along the way. So the Sanhedrin arrested the apostles which, um, because of their jealousy. And, and that leads to a pretty cool prison break in verses 19 to 21. What do you think of this prison break? So there's not a lot of details here, but the plan seems rather simple. An angel came and miraculously released them and told them to go back to what they had been doing and, and where they had been doing it. Almost like the arrest itself had never happened. Now, I don't have a lot of experience with 
prison breaks, but I would think that during a prison break, the last thing you should do is return to the scene of the crime. But that's what God wanted them to do. Actually, the word translated here as stand also means to stand fast, to establish, to be firm, to endure. God knew what he was calling them to do and what the result would be. He was calling them in the face of persecution to go and make a stand for the gospel. Keep that in mind as we continue. Let's pick things up with the second half of verse 21. Now, when the high priest came and those who were with him, they called together the council, all the senate of the people of Israel, and sent to the prison to have them brought. But when the officers came, they did not find them in the prison, so they returned and reported. We found the prison securely locked and the guards standing at the doors, but when we opened them, we found no one inside. Now, when the captain of the temple and the chief priests heard these words, they were greatly perplexed about them, wondering what this would come to. And someone came and told them, Look, the men whom you put in prison are standing in the temple and teaching the people. Then the captain with the officers went and brought them, but not by force, for they were afraid of being stoned by the people. Okay, so can you picture this? What do you think of this scene? I find this part of the story to be very amusing. I think it kind of makes the Sanhedrin and the temple guards look kind of silly. The Sanhedrin were meeting, feeling all high and mighty, talking about what to do with these people they had arrested, never realizing that God had already freed them. So when they sent for the prisoners, they, find, they found out that while the guards were still at their posts and the doors were still locked, the prisoners themselves were gone. This miraculous prison break had them perplexed. They were utterly at a loss to explain what had happened. And then, to make things even worse, some guy showed up in the midst of all that and told them that the guys that they had arrested um, and who were now missing were actually back in the temple preaching again. Not only is this cool, but it's also significant because they were preaching in the temple, and that would have signified authority. I mean, think about it. These guys were in the temple. The fact that they were back in the temple preaching after they had been arrested and put in jail and then miraculously released and sent back would have been a significant display of their authority to be there, superseding that of the Sanhedrin who were trying to keep them away. And notice in verse 26 that the officers brought them back to the council, but this time not by force, because they were afraid of the response of the people. The people were watching all of this transpire, and I'm sure that it had an impact upon their thoughts of the gospel. Let's keep going. Pick things up with verse 27. And when they had brought them, they set them before the council, and the high priest questioned them, saying, We strictly charge you not to teach in this name, yet you here you have filled... Jerusalem with your teaching, and you intend to bring this man's blood upon us. But Peter and the apostles answered, We must obey God rather than men. The God of our fathers raised Jesus, whom you killed by hanging him on a tree. God exalted him at his right hand as leader and savior to give him re- to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. And we are witnesses to these things, and so is the Holy Spirit, whom God has given to those who obey him. So what do you think of the high priest's question? Well, actually, it's not really a question, is it? It's more of an accusation. The high priest was not really looking for answers from them. He was not giving them an opportunity to defend themselves um, or to defend the gospel. He didn't even really pursue trying to figure out how they escaped. Instead, he simply laid out the council's complaint against them. and, And in it, we can see the council's thoughts and fears. They were upset that the apostles had directly ignored their orders to stop preaching, and they were upset specifically because the apostles were blaming them for killing Jesus. Then in verses 29 to 32, we see the apostles' response, and notice that once again it is Peter who serves as their voice. The same Peter who God discipled, or who who Jesus discipled is um, throughout the Gospels. This same Peter who made some impetuous mistakes along the way, This same guy was being used by God to lead the church in the early days. And what do you think of the response that we see in verses 29 to 32? So it's it's really quite simple, isn't it? It's not that they were trying to make the Sanhedrin look bad or rebel against their authority. It's just that they had to follow God's rules and obey him over the rules of man. We talked about this a few weeks ago. They're, they're, they were following the Great Commission on their lives. They, they had been called to, to, to be witnesses and to make disciples, and that was what they were doing, and they could not stop, even if it meant persecution. Now, one other thing that I want to point out is that in Peter's answer um, is the reference to the Trinity. Um, he mentions the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit in his answer, each one independent of the other. 
acting in their own ways and yet in complete unity with each other. Overall, it's a bold answer that includes the gospel with mention of the crucifixion and the resurrection, repentance, and the forgiveness of sins. It's all there. I love it. But the Sanhedrin didn't. Let's pick things up with verse 33. When they heard this, they were enraged and wanted to kill them. But a Pharisee in the council named Gamaliel, a teacher of the law, held in honor by all the people, stood up and gave orders to put the men outside for a little while. And he said to them, Men of Israel, take care of what you are about to do with these men. For before these days, Theudas rose up, claiming to be somebody, and a number of men, about 400, joined him. He was killed, and all who followed him were dispersed and came to nothing. After him, Judas the Galilean rose up in the days of the census and drew away some of the people after him. He too perished, and all who followed him were scattered. So in this present case, I tell you, keep away from these men and let them alone. For if this plan or this undertaking is of man, it will fail. But if it is of God, you will not be able to overthrow them. You might even be found opposing God. So they took his advice, and when they had called in the apostles, they beat them and charged them not to speak in the name of Jesus and let them go. So verse 33 says that the Sanhedrin were enraged and wanted to kill them. That seems kind of extreme, doesn't it? The word there for enraged means to defy with a saw, uh, to, to cut to the heart, to ground the teeth in rage. Why were they so angry? Well, earlier we saw that their motivation was jealousy. I think they probably also felt threatened and need, maybe even felt kind of powerless and vulnerable. Think about it. Not only were these men preaching a gospel that was different than what they were teaching, but also they were proclaiming Jesus to be the Messiah and pointing out that the Sanhedrin were the ones responsible for putting him to death. That's a big deal. The Jews grew up hearing about the Messiah, looking forward to the day when he would come and liberate his people. And the apostles were saying that the Messiah had come and the Sanhedrin killed him. And in addition, they were saying that this same Jesus had risen from the dead and it was by his power and in his name by which they were doing these miraculous, amazing, wonderful things and, and all the preaching and the, the gospel and, and, and thousands of people were, were flocking to them and hearing the gospel and believing it and responding. Uh, they were scared and probably felt cornered and l looking for a way out. So they wanted to kill them. But then verse 34 speaks of a Pharisee who was on the council by the name of Gamaliel. What do you think of Gamaliel? So while much of the Sanhedrin were Sadducees, Gamaliel was a Pharisee, a different Jewish school uh, with some different religious beliefs. They were often opposed to the Sanhedrin to the, or to the Sadducees on many religious matters, although they had some of the same basic ideas. There were many specific things that they differed on. They were outnumbered by the Sadducees on the council, but the, San, the, the, the Sadducees and the Pharisees were at least somewhat united against Christianity. Now, this particular Pharisee, Gamaliel, was well respected. We see mention of him in other writings outside of Scripture that suggest that he was held in high esteem by many. We even see him mentioned later on in the book of Acts as the teacher of a man named Saul of Tarsus, who would eventually become known as Paul. Here we see him calling the council to think before they act. He tried to get them to cool down by reminding them of some other revolutionaries who made claims and led people to rebel. But over time, those uprisings went nowhere. And so he advised them to leave these guys alone. Because if their plan was man-made, it would eventually fail. But if it was really from God, then they wouldn't be able to stop it and would eventually find themselves fighting against God. What do you think of his advice? I think it's wise advice, right? The comparison to the revolutionary suggests that maybe he didn't really understand what Jesus had come to do and what the gospel was really all about, but it's still good advice. And it was effective, at least to some extent. The rest of the council listened, and they, it says that they took his advice. But notice what they did in verse 40. It says they beat them and threatened them and then let them go. What do you think of that? It seems kind of severe, doesn't it? Most likely this would have been 40 lashes minus one, where the apostles would have been flogged or whipped across the back and chest, leaving them close to death. A very severe punishment, even if they didn't kill them. It's interesting to see the escalation of the persecution they faced. Remember the last time it was just threats and one night in jail. This time it was more threats, accompanied by a severe beating. And over the next couple of chapters, it even moves on to death. The persecution of the early church has begun, and in verses 41 and 42, we see the response. But before I read this, um, I want to ask you just for a moment, what do you think you would have been thinking and feeling if you were one of these guys? 
if you had just been beaten severely and threatened um, because of preaching the gospel, uh, what would be going through your thoughts and through your emotions? Think about that as we then take a look at their response, picking things up with verse 41. Then they left the presence of the council, rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer dishonor for the name. And every day in the temple and from house to house, they did not cease cease teaching and preaching that the Christ is Jesus. What do you think of their response? They rejoiced and boldly continued their mission. I love it, even though it's kind of hard to wrap my mind around. I I kind of get the idea of boldly continuing the mission. Uh, That that seems like like you're just determined and to endure and to keep going but the part about rejoicing seems pretty incredible suffering dishonor for the sake of christ was something that they saw as worthwhile i find it beautiful and humbling because i know my own heart and and how likely i am to avoid suffering and dishonor and persecution makes me wonder what my response would have been if i had been in their shoes but i also know that um, Their response didn't come from them. It came from the Lord who was at work within them. And that same Lord is at work within me. And I I trust that if the time ever came for me to face something like this, that he would give me the grace to face it. So this is a powerful story, isn't it, of how Peter and the apostles faced persecution and suffering for the sake of the gospel. There's a lot here in these verses. But before I give you my closing thoughts, let me ask you, what jumps out most to you from this story? For me, the part that stands out the most is actually the words of Gamaliel uh, when he says, For if this plan or this undertaking is of man, it will fail. But if it is of God, you will not be able to overthrow them. You might even be found opposing God. I love those words. Think about how true they are. You know, one of the commentaries that I read actually referred to this as the Gamaliel principle. I like that. It's actually kind of ironic when we think of historically how this all played out. As the first century began to come to a close, the temple was destroyed, the Sanhedrin were in shambles, and then a couple of centuries after that, they were completely dissolved. Yet even in the face of of terrible persecution, the gospel flourished and spread, first through Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria, and then to the ends of the earth and down through the ages, we are a testimony to the fact that the gospel cannot be stopped because it is of God. Make no mistake about it, God is sovereign. We live in a sin-cursed world that is chaotic and often seems out of whack and difficult to understand, but God's plans will succeed. That's true on a global scale, but it's also important for us to understand personally, not just because it's comforting to remember that ultimately God's plans will succeed, but also when we consider our own plans. There's a lot we could do with our lives. There are a lot of causes we could join. There are a lot of projects we can get behind and support. Even when it comes to the church itself, there are many different ways of going about ministry and mission. But for me, what I see in the Gamaliel Principle is the reminder that ultimately the only things that will last are the things of God. As I get older, I realize that I have less energy to spend on doing all kinds of things. And I look around me and, and more than ever, I see that there are too many different things to count. I see lots of places that that I could spend my time and energy and material possessions even. There's so much that I could be doing, good things, right things. But ultimately, what I want to do is God's things. I want to join him where he is at work. I want to be right in the center of his will. I want to be going where he leads, doing what he wants, speaking and acting in his power and his strength and his authority rather than my own. I want him to fill me and use me and to accomplish his will, not what I think is best. Because ultimately, if it is of me, it will fail. But if it is of him, then nothing will be able to stand against it. This Gamalow principle is a good idea, a good guide for our everyday lives. Let's stop chasing after our plans and join God in what he wants to do in us and through us to his honor and glory. That's my challenge for us today. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you for uh, this passage and for what you show us in this. I thank you for your work and your power and your authority in this world. I thank you for that, the fact that that is displayed in this passage, but also in our daily lives. 
I pray that you would help us to trust in you, to be reminded of, of, of your sovereignty. And help us also, Lord, to be submitting ourselves to you, to recognizing that it is your plans and your will and your work that is what is going to last and, and be good. Help us to stop chasing after our own things and start yielding our lives to your lordship, your will, your work, and your glory. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.